Thank you. And I'm really delighted to be here. I mean, what a treat to be in an institute of life course, for a start, but at a narrative inquiry conference and with people who, I gather, want to enjoy themselves. <laughs> I think you can see me better. Yeah, OK. And um, what I want to do is, obviously, I want to talk for a while, but then really to have discussion um, with you about anything that you're interested in from what I've said or that you think that I missed out or whatever. And what I want to do is to spend a little time thinking about why it is that narrative research has proliferated so much. Why is it so popular? Because it's gone from strength to strength and gone across disciplines really remarkably over the last couple of decades. And also then to think about the proliferation of narrative approaches and then to give some examples um, from the, the research node, the National Center for Research Methods node that I was the principal investigator in. So I want to tell you about the studies um, that were involved in that. Can you hear me properly or am I hissing or something at the back? Fantastic. Okay, so to start off then, and I should say that I have a terrible failing. I've given lots of talks, but I continue to have an enormous failing, which is when I think about a subject, I always think about a million things I want to say. And consequently, I always have too much and therefore frequently have to leave out something. So I hope that if I do, that you won't start throwing things at me because uh, I've warned you about it in advance. Okay. Uh, you know, maybe as I go into sort of later life, by the time I retire, I might get better. But it hasn't happened as yet. Okay. So why is it that uh, we are using narrative research in ever-increasing numbers? Well, you, many of you will know the story. First of all, that lives themselves are storied. We understand them so much better when we tell stories about them and when we have stories in the culture that can represent particular lives. So Jerome Bruner, who I very much like, talks about human beings. He's not the only one who does that. Fisher does as well. But humans as homo norans, storytelling people. And basically, talking about the way in which our way of making sense of the world is a storied way. For that reason, children become skilled at telling stories very early in their lives and certainly at understanding stories. Three-year-olds know the genre of the fairy tale, but they know many other genre too. They know what constitutes a story. And if they ask you for a story and you say that you, you can't tell stories, they'll often try to teach you what it is that you have to do, other than the content. They know the structure. And so as Kathy Reisman says, they're skilled very early, and they know about the familiar genre very early as well. But also, stories are very persuasive. And the, the pictures here are simply, I just took some autobiographies. You know, there are millions of autobiographies, particularly in the global north. It's one of the ways in which people get a grip on their lives through telling particular stories about them and having particular stories that they want other people to apprehend, that they want to control. So there are lots and lots of different autobiographies out there in the storied lives canon. And because of all those things that I've just been saying, stories are certainly resources for research. And that's one reason that they've become so very popular and proliferated. People use them to make sense of the world, not just as the people whose stories they are, but all of us, either as researchers or as people who are always listening to stories. We hear stories from our friends and families all the time. So they're an ontological resource. They're about the nature of being, about what it's like to be human and live in particular worlds. But then, they're also proliferated because they allow different epistemological takes. And that's important. You could be somebody who wants to read off reality from the stories that people tell. Or, and I think more people probably are like this, you could be wanting to engage with the ways in which people construct meanings. But whatever you want to do, epistemologically, Stories, narratives give you an entry point 
into analysing what's happening in the social world. So they're flexible and they're also dynamic. So as Molly Andrews and colleagues, and I know uh, Maria Tambuku came and did a keynote uh, a couple of years ago, perhaps. Uh, so, so from the Center for Narrative Research, talk about in their Doing Narrative Research second edition, these are resources that are dynamic. They change over time. They change over time partly because people tell different stories. They change over time because the culture allows different stories. You just need to think, for example, it's just been uh, International Women's Day. The way that women can tell their stories now is very different from the way in which our grandmothers w were able to tell their stories. Now, I'm not suggesting everybody in the audience is the same age. For some of you, the grandmothers will be the mothers or, or whatever, but you, you get the point that I'm making. And they're also flexible. They can shift with um, the telling to different audiences they can shift over the life course and so on. And very importantly, they can be used with other methods. And that's one of the things that's changed over the last 20 years or so, that people are much more likely to combine narrative methods. And one of the ways in which that they, they can be combined is uh, statistically as well. Now, Jane Elliott is now the director of the Economic and Social Research Council um, so the funding body, but she was for many years at the Institute of Education where, where I am, and she was part of Novella, in fact, still, still is a tiny part of Novella. But she's also somebody who's not only written a book on narrative, but who's as comfortable doing multi-level <coughs> modeling, statistical modeling, as she is doing qualitative narrative analysis, so unusual. And in her inaugural professorial lecture in 2013, um, she says, statistical analyses are needed to address some of the key policy questions facing society today. However, we also have an obligation to pay attention to the individual stories that lie behind those statistics. And I think one of the exciting things is thinking how one does that. We could debate the different ways in which one might link quantitative and narrative um, uh, resources together. But they can be linked. And many of you will be familiar with this much cited quote from Kathy Reesman's 2008 book, but which I think is much cited because it is so apposite. It does so well explain what narrative research is about. Um, in everyday st oral storytelling, a speaker connects events into a sequence that's consequential for later action and for the meanings that the speaker wants listeners to take away from the story. Events perceived by the speaker are selected, organized, connected, and evaluated as meaningful for a particular audience. And I think that contains so much that's important, that somebody has to select, however fast, however unconsciously, mean, uh, particular stories to tell and connect them up, connect events up, so taking some organization evaluating them as meaningful for particular audiences. One does not tell the same story in the same way to all audiences. What I would tell you about my life here would be very different from what I would tell my friend after an evening where we've been chatting about and putting the world to rights through our stories, and very different from what I tell my employer, perhaps. Okay? And we're all like that. It's not that we're, we're liars, but that actually one of the skilled things that we do is knowing what's appropriate. So if I began to tell you certain details about myself, you would soon either switch off or think, why on earth did they invite her? How inappropriate, you know, so, and so on. There are limits to tellability. There are upper and lower bounds of tellability. Equally, if I told you things that are totally appropriate, but I began to tell you them from second to second, not only would most of you go to sleep, and uh, I heard some of you saying already you wanted to sit where you could fidget. <laughs> uh, don't worry, I won't, I won't say who you are, but you've outed yourself, um, <laughs> actually. Uh, not only would you do that, but actually, again, it would be in its own way inappropriate. There are lower bounds to tellability as well. Okay, so this is a really good quote from Kathy Reesman. Jerome, Jerome Bruner has been somebody who has really got the debate going about um, 
uh, the way in which identities and narratives are linked. And I think this is a key way in which, for example, um, it's, a, it's a big difference from people who want to do, for example, conversation analysis, wanting to think about autobiographical narratives to think about identities. So in Life as Narrative, Jerome Bruno put forward the notion that we make and account for ourselves through our autobiographical narratives, life as story. And um, while that's been much debated and softened, it's an important issue. And part of that means that temporality is important, the past, the present, and the future. We tell stories in the present, often about the past, but always in anticipation of the future. And as our future changes, because of the roads we haven't taken, or because of the things that have happened to us, so our past also changes, and we recast that as well. And many of you will be familiar with that. And I couldn't resist, since, since I'm really keen on Bruna, having a picture of his um, 100th birthday uh, cake there with him. And he's still working, still sharp thinking. I last saw him at 98 give a keynote. I haven't seen him in the last couple of years. Okay. Another reason that narrative analysis has proliferated is because they can deal not just with individual lives and individual lives in societal context, but politics as well. Political narratives do a great deal. One of the things that they do is potentially to help move societies and individuals away from trauma, traumatic pasts, into futures that are less traumatic. And I just have here um, uh, Desmond Tutu talking about the truth and uh, talking at the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission in South Africa, where of course a lot of reconciliation needed to be done, a lot of trauma needed to be lived through. And um, uh, here's Nelson Mandela with the reports from the Truth and Re Reconciliation Commission. Okay, I'm not going to read that out. But also, our political narratives, presented in various ways, help to construct national identities. And they do what Mick, Mick Billig, the discourse analyst, calls flagging the nation daily. They do it so implicitly we don't notice. So here is Nelson's column, which is in the middle of London, in Trafalgar Square. And um, uh, one of the things that, that that does is certainly flag the nation. And as Francesca Paletta, who's done a lot of work on political narratives, points out, what political narratives do when they're constructing various identities is um, draw on a cultural stock of plots and reproduce them as well. And it's that, that cultural stock of plots, that makes some stories more tellable than other stories. And as um, uh, Molly Andrews, as well as Francesca Paletta point out, the stories that we tell about our lives, the individual stories, are always within a context of political change and political shifts and sometimes contestation. So they don't have to be stories overtly about politics in order to be stories that are political because they are about who we are and who we are not. And those are political issues. And we sometimes see that clearly, but implicitly they are as well. And I put Nelson's column there because it's a public monument. These are always national political narratives that are historically located and that can be contested. What about Nelson's column? It was built to comm commemorate, commemorate, I can hardly speak, commemorate a particular battle. And it's one, of course, that the British won. It wouldn't have been built to commemorate a battle that the British felt that they lost. Okay? And it was built at a great cost. It's built very, very high, okay? in order that you can see it all the way round and that people can understand that this is a nation that's won battles, proud of itself for doing so. And that's really important. Okay, but then in, in um, um, the United Kingdom, there's been more recently, as in the United States and in South Africa, a lot of debate, passionate debate and disagreement about what should be commemorated and how and what should stop being commemorated. And this is a building in Oxford University with, you can see the man at the top 
of the building, not the, not the person, the statue, uh, Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes. And um, Cecil Rhodes has been removed from Cape Town University and uh, also um, uh, they've been debated in the United States and Oxford students voted by a relatively slim margin to, to have it removed and the university considered this, in the end decided not to do it because some of their benefactors said they wouldn't give money if Rhodes was removed, okay? which shows the contestation, which shows how much it mattered. And then, um, if you look at the bottom uh, right-hand corner, you'll see Francis Galton there. Those of you who are psychologists will know that he's often referred to as the father of individual differences in psychology. He was also um, a co-founder of the eugenics movement okay, um, on the basis of his research of, on the sons of famous men, 300 sons of famous men. And... Um, the, the reason that uh, this was in the Times Higher Education is that there are people calling for uh, the Galton Lecture Theatre to be renamed in U University College London, where I work, okay? thinking that it's inappropriate. I'm not going to read out this quote, which comes from the Times Higher Education. The point being that these are parts, these are aspects of national identities and local identities, whether they're the universities or other things, and they're flagged daily. You don't have to think every time you step into the Galton Lecture Theatre. And indeed, I had equal opportunities training in it recently. Um, you don't have to think, what on earth am I doing in here, when he would not have had me walk in you know, to a university in the first place as a woman, as somebody black, you know, and uh, somebody who, who's come from the working classes. All of those things would be wrong for Galton. You don't have to think that in order for this to be something that's flagged and that's potentially, therefore, contestable. Okay. And as uh, various people are beginning to say, but Nicola Rollock here, these constitute historically located implicit microaggressions in academia, in academe. Okay. They relate to what Foucault called epistemic violence and Gayatri Ch Chakravorty Spivak as well. So very interesting but not straightforward. They're debated, they're contested. Okay. okay, so moving on to the proliferation of narrative approaches. And one of the things that the Doing Narrative Research um, second edition makes quite clear is that whereas it used to be that we could all have a mantra about what constituted narrative, which would have something to do about, with temporality, for example. That that's no longer the case. That there are fast-changing conceptualizations of narrative. So temporality, the past, the present, and the future, still important, but there are other ways in which people want to, to think about narratives. Not just time, but space, place, so on, um, through objects. And we have to think about things like positioning, um, both, uh, in, in thinking about subjectification in a Foucauldian sense, but also the classic, now classic, um, 1990 paper by Davis and Harry on positioning in interactions. So positioning is one thing. Various people suggest that we need to think about um, uh, narratives in a psychosocial sense, and perhaps the best proponent, the best known proponents of those are Holwit and Jefferson, who again have a second edition of their book doing qualitative research differently, which came out in 2013. And they talk about looking at the defended subject. What is it that people are doing with their narratives that has psychoanalytic, psychodynamic um, resonances? And uh, in their 2013 update, they've had to say, well, various people pointed out that we looked at the defended subject and not enough at the defended researcher. So if we're really interested in co-constructions of narratives, which many people are, we have psychosocially to think about what the researchers bringing, both in terms of asking questions or setting up particular projects, but also in analysis. And then performativity, drawing on, well, many people's work, but, but um, certainly thinking about Judith Butler's work on performativity. Uh, and, and some people go to Goffman, for example, that we do things with our talk. 
and whether it's autobiographical or other talk, it's performative. So how do we take account of that? And then um, another current has been contesting the notion of big stories. So um, uh, Michael Bamberg called Mark Freeman's approach, for example, life on holiday. Big stories, that we're not all telling big stories all the time that narratives are done in interaction, and that therefore we need to think about small stories. Well, more recently, um, Bamberg has wanted to talk about narrative practices or narratives in interaction to avoid any suggestion that small stories are uh, pejoratively tiny because they're, they're, they're bigger than tiny. They're the things that we do all the time. We don't tell big, clear stories. We tell little fragments of stories all the time, and those can be analysed narratively. So um, uh, Anna Dafina and Alexandra Georgiakopoulou also have done quite a lot on small stories. And all these things are really synthesised in many people's work, or bits are drawn on. So it's, I've put a temporary settlement, a temporary understanding of what narratives are about. And then the whole issue also of identities. And Arnulf Depperman, who I've quoted here, but also it could be Bamberg and, and so on. Identities are deployed, he says, in situated narrative interaction. Okay. Practice theory also, the way in which in everyday practices people use um, uh, narratives and employ them. And Jens Brockmeyer's most recent book, published at the end of last year, is on memory and really going beyond seeing memories as something that's archival. So I think it's called something like archives of memory. And he talks about malleability, mutability, and constructivi constructivity around memories. And that's really important for narrative. You'll know that uh, Jens Brockmeier is a, uh, a really good narrative scholar. So memory being crucially important, but malleable memories. And as McLean and Thorne suggest, reconstruction, reconstruction of memories happens particularly about times of trouble and difficulty. And that also fits very much with what Cathy Reesman says, that there is uh, much more likely to be a narrative produced. And therefore, people are much more likely to have well-worn narratives when there is a disjunction between the ideal and what's really happened to them. So. Um, times of trouble are really important. So, oh, it says so on this, this screen. So there are various concerns that we can look at in narrative research, and this is hardly exhaustive. We can look at, and narrative scholars look at stories and how they're presented. They look at structure, you know, particularly the most famous person being Lebov, um, very um, uh, structural linguistically uh, you know, sort of um, form, form, uh, formulaic, but also people like G and poetics and so on. And much less formal, lots of people want to look at how stories are structured, how what people say is structured. But also temporality, time and sequence. Sequence is always in what people tell. So it's both the sequence of their story, starting perhaps from birth going up to five, but also the way in which they've told it, the sequence in which they've told. So time and sequence do matter, even though they're less privileged than they were in narrative analyses. And many people obviously want to look at content, themes, experiences, meanings in complicated ways. Context, the cast of characters, and that means looking at personal pronouns sometimes, um, as well as the social, historical and interactional contexts and what people don't say that they might say, which seems strange, but it's equally important to look at what might be there and isn't. And this is not exhaustive at all. And um, in terms of what people look at, this is just putting together various things. The bit in the, um, at the bottom uh, towards the right is from a map produced in a project, um, a well, a project of, of ours in Novella, um, which I'll tell you about in a moment. So mapping, people's drawings, uh, art, certainly looking at people's objects and um, diaries and so on. But now blogs, 
very much people look at, and all sorts of visual um, uh, narratives that, that people are concerned with. I'm not going to read all this out, but the British Library has put up um, uh, things about narrative analysis, narrative research, and these are some of the things that they say that people look at and what constitutes narrative. Again, you can see that they very much fit with things that I've said already. Okay. So moving on to look at novella and what we did there. And this, in one diagram, encapsulates everything that novella uh, is about. It's a national centre for research methods node. Um, and what that means is that it looks at um, substantive issues through the methodological. And in this case, the me methodological things that we were interested in are in purple on the left side. So we were interested in thinking about narratives in line with practices and identities. We were interested in secondary narrative analysis, something that, that people hadn't done before. So looking at data already produced and reusing it narratively. And I'll show you how um, we, we did that in the various studies in a moment. And then we were interested in linking data. Okay? And then what we had to do was to save a third of the money that, that we uh, got for training and capacity building. So there's a lot of resources on our website, including a film that um, really s says what we're about and some of our findings. Um, and we did a lot of workshops, masterclasses, courses, symposia, and so on. And then in the middle, in the light blue, are the three projects that were on our proposal. All of them concerned with family habitual practices. So parenting identities and practices, family lives and the environment across continents, and families and food. And then we had to apply for more money to do small-scale projects linked with other nodes or with the hub in Southampton. Um, and there, there were six national nodes altogether. Um, unfortunately, three of them in Bloomsbury. I say unfortunately because they were national nodes, but it's, it was competitively done, and three of them came to um, uh, uh, Bloomsbury, two and a half to the Institute of Education, which seems not... Um, that national, but was. So one of the projects was food blogs, which we did with Mode, another Institute of Education um, node, which is multi-modal um, and digital environments. Um, and they also have interesting things on their website. And the other on Paradata, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a little while. You can see how big the team is, including Molly Andrews and Corinne Squire, who you know already, but lots of, of us, and that it was across three institutions. So the Institute of Education, the Centre for Narrative Research at University of East London, and Young Lives, which is a longitudinal um, uh, study of children living in poverty in four countries, 15-year study. Okay, so one of the things that we were concerned to do is to do different versions of secondary narrative analysis. And there's been a contestation of the notion of secondary narrative analysis or secondary analysis per se with many people wanting to use reuse instead because um, there is no study that completely exhausts material particularly when it's narrative and therefore to what extent is it secondary analysis but reuse most people agree so parenting identities and practices Julia Brennan and I um, uh, co-directed that and that um, is something that brought together material from Transforming Experiences, which is a study of mine, and Julia's Fathering Across the Generations, which was um, a, a study of uh, three generations, grandfather, father, and, and um, uh, sons in childhood, um, who were Polish, Irish, and um, uh, white, white British uh, men. And my transforming experiences had three studies in it, which were all to do something with uh, migration. One, children who were language brokers for their parents, interpreting and so on, and um, <coughs> translating for their parents. 
serial migrant children who had migrated after their parents did, and um, also those growing up in visibly ethnically different households. And the, the point is that we had to ask new research questions of the old data, and that's one of the key things about reuse. You've got to ask your own questions, and they have to be questions appropriate to the data sets. So we asked about what kind of stories are told about parenting and family life in relation to migration, because Julia's sample had the Irish grandfathers migrating and Polish fathers migrating. Um, also, what ambivalences and ambiguities occur in narratives about family lives in those contexts, and how do we make sense of family practices? And methodologically, we had diff slightly different interviewing processes. So how do we bring those together? And what kind of methods can we use when there are different kinds of secondary analysts? So Julia knew her study. I knew my study. Other people knew neither study. And not only that, but since uh, Julia's and my studies were both bigger than we could do on our own, we didn't know equally well all the material in the, in the study. Okay. So one of the things that we had to do is to develop a new data set. Um, and we did that around only one of my studies and only the men in that study to link with Julia's study, which was on, on fathers and grandfathers and, um, and boys. And we only used the Irish grandfathers of Julia's. So that's the first thing, that you can't necessarily use all the material. You have to think what you're linking up and so on. And we've produced some methodological um, uh, ideas about that. And we've got a new paper that's just come out on ethnic and racial studies, which is not yet um, on paper, but just online at the moment. And it's freely available because it being an economic and social research council funded study, everything has to be um, open access. So uh, I'm pleased to say. Um, and we also did some secondary analysis of the cohort studies that Jane Elliott worked on. And uh, we're waiting to hear whether a paper is going to be published linking, in this case, um, a few of the white British fathers with millennium cohort um, material. And we, we got some new analyses done for that in the millennium cohort. Okay. That's all I want to say about that study. I want to spend a little bit more time on family lives and the environment. And this was something that, uh, where Janet Boddy was the PI and I was um, one of the, I was the, the co-I on this. And this both collected new material and drew on the Young Lives um, uh, narrative material in order to help us understand the complexity of environments in family lives. Because frequently now, thinking about environment, thinking about climate change, lots of claims are made and lots of notions that children as the future should be a site for intervention in um, climate change debates and that families certainly ought to be. But we wanted to take a step back and to try to understand what environment means to families and how it's lived and experienced by different members of families. So the Young Lives um, data set we drew on, and we particularly drew on their Andhra Pradesh, um, Telangana um, uh, study, so in India, because we, we collected new data in India and the UK. And what we did was, in India and the UK, we simply, for the new data collection, picked up 12 families and also did some work in school, which um, has been particularly analyzed by Catherine Walker, and she's just waiting for the PhD on that to be um, vivid this month, um, in a few days, in fact. Um, and it's a multi-method approach. Interviews, certainly, and interviews sometimes on vignettes, interviews with groups of children, interviews with families together, and also um, we did walking interviews where we wanted to take uh, the 12-year-old child, because we, we, it was around... Um, children in, in school year seven or eight in, in the UK, age 12, um, roughly. And we wanted to take them for a walk. And obviously, um, uh, family members generally came with them. Um, and sometimes it was a drive, particularly in India, where, when it was very hot. And um, for the affluent families, uh, they, they sometimes took us for a drive. 
Um, and we also did photography and had them map their, their neighborhoods as well and the places they liked, they didn't like, and so on. Okay. We looked at urban and rural. We looked at those who were relatively affluent and those who, who weren't. And one of the things that was quite clear is that big environmental issues show up when you're thinking about the local, when you're thinking about family habitual practices. And um, uh, I won't say, say more about that, apart, about this slide, apart from to say that certainly the affluent in India and the affluent in the United Kingdom have much more in common with each other than, do, than they do with the poor in their countries and then, than um, the poor across the countries have with each other. But first of all, to think about the diverse meanings of environment. And um, the first picture here was a picture that Janet Boddy took when we went for our pilot. And it's a woman jasmine seller at the side of the road in Andhra Pradesh. And one of the things that quickly became clear is that um, uh, women in Andhra Pradesh generally wear jasmine in their hair, fresh jasmine every day. It's, it smells fantastic, not like jasmine I've ever smelled in Britain. So it's perfume, but it's also really beautiful and lots of different kinds. Okay. But there had been um, floods, unusual flooding, and that meant that the price of jasmine went up so that not all women could afford to, to buy jasmine anymore. So very quickly, a big environmental um, uh, issue becomes local and differentiates the poor and the more affluent very much, and it's a gendered one anyway here. The next one is a picture, um, I think probably also taken by Janet. She's a much better <coughs> photographer than I am. Um, and it's of a lane um, where uh, a, what the 12-year-old who we were seeing there was not allowed to play on the other side. And the reason that he wasn't was because there'd been this unusual flooding. The other side of the lane wasn't yet populated. It's a new neighborhood. And um, therefore, there wasn't anybody to cut down the vegetation and snakes become much more prevalent. Now, Andhra Pradesh is one of the places in the world, one, one of the highest um, uh, prevalences in the world of people dying from snake bite. So not surprisingly, it changes behavior, and particularly for children. So it's, it's generationally uh, important where you can go and so on. And here a quote from a mother in um, uh, Andhra Pradesh, an affluent mother. They live in a gated community. So she says, if I switch on the air conditioning in my car, my kids will shout, Amma, you're increasing the global warming. Switch it off. Polar bears will die. She laughs every time. This is the fight in the car. And Natasha, who, who was there um, uh, doing this interview, um, and what do you say when the kids say that? We just laugh. We keep telling them it's not just because we switch on the AC. It's one of the factors, though. And Natasha says, so then what happens? Who wins? Definitely them. You cannot argue with them. Then after a couple of minutes, they'll forget, and then I'll switch it on. I'm not supposed to lie, though. Especially this girl is very particular. Let's open the windows as we drive because we're killing the polar bears. And I should say polar bears were the key signifier in both countries for children who, you know, really didn't know necessarily know that much about polar bears, but they knew that really global um, environmental uh, behavior was important for polar bears. Okay. Whenever she turns on the AC when she wants to sleep, I tell her, polar bears are crying. Why are you switching on the, the AC? Okay. So wh what does it show? Um, the emblem, you know, polar bears are emblematic, ma emblematic as, I, as I say. Um, but one of the things that serves to do is to distance climate change. Okay. All sorts of things are happening in India and in the UK. But the polar bear helps to distance it from everybody, apart from, I suppose, those who are relatively near the polar bears. Then you can see in this quote that this mother is um, you know, talking as an affectionate, partnered mother. She invokes her husband, who allows her children power. It's certainly an affluent positioning, and their, affluent, their everyday practices show how concern for the environment and, and comfort are negotiated together. Okay? And also that children don't have ultimate power, necessarily, even if parents are affectionate about it. 
So here, another family, um, an affluent one in the UK. We've changed the way we live over the last 10 years to minimize our carbon footprint. We think that everybody did, I suppose, took the same responsible position that we're taking. The whole country's carbon, carbon footprint would be, you know, we'd meet our targets, blah, blah. So the mother says, I think it's partly because we read the newspaper. I've been quite startled at intelligent, I thought well-informed people who just last year were not aware that fish stocks were running out. And the son, 12-year-old, says, even I knew that. And the mother says, well, that's partly because we keep telling you. Okay. And again, distant environmental issues brought into everyday practices. And the parents here claiming identities, moral identities of responsible affluence, as, as we've called it. They're claiming identities as intelligent and well-informed. And what they're doing is, in Janet Finch's terms, displaying family as well as power relations here through their environmental practices as reported. And they're invoking the past, the present, and the future as consequential temporalities here and making a case for change in everyday practices. But certainly, it's not a family where you would say that the son could, make the, could have the biggest influence on, on the parents. Okay? Somebody else, an, a state school in the United um, <coughs> Kingdom again. Um, the mother says, what goes on in our lives every day matters to me more than what goes on in the environment. It's more important. I'm not saying that it's, it, the environment's not important, but for me, doesn't, what goes on in our everyday lives, and she's saying matters more. So her son then says, did you know pollution can kill you? And there's been quite a lot in the news about how many people are actually dying in places like London silently. Or I don't know if they're dying silently, but you know what I mean, that, they, that it's, it's not remarked on. Um, and the mother says, because that's what affects us most. Um, and Helen, who did the interview here, are there any particular things in your immediate environment that affect you more than other things? Well, it's just general everyday daily life, like making sure the kids go to school, the, sh the shopping's done. You know, it's just washing everything, general living, that's what we have to deal with. Well, here, she's also doing family display, but she's making sure that we know, despite her straitened circumstances, despite being a lone mother, that actually she does looking after her family well. She does the washing. She does the shopping. She makes sure that they eat well. And she, she's talking about the temporality of the everyday as well, everyday mundane tasks, to do with social reproduction. And she, she makes the claim that environmental issues have to be <coughs> subordinate because her identity is as a responsible mother who fulfills her care responsibilities. And for that, she's not gonna listen to what her son has to say about environmental issues, however much the school tells um, them that um, uh, uh, children need to, to influence their parents. So I'm going to move on because time I can see is running out. The next study, just to give you a flavour of it, was Families and Food in Hard Times. Rebecca O'Connell was the PI and Julia Brannan the co-I and Abigail Knight also worked on it. And they used mass observation, um, 1950 diaries and oral histories from the First World War, as well as visual sources like this teenage cookery book that you see there. Okay. Um, uh, and um, what they wanted to do was to get away from, um, they'd, they'd already done together a, a piece of work on food, and indeed, Rebecca now has um, a European Research Council big project across countries on food and food practices in austerity. Um, and they wanted to get away from the way in which food practices are steeped in normativity and shame and guilt, and they wanted to think about how you could get at food practices in things that weren't designed to be just about food practices in, in reuse of data. So they wanted to think about something that was key to what we were doing in Novella, which is bridging the disconnect between behavior and constructed meanings in studying families' um, food habitual practices. Okay. And so they did secondary analyses of those sources I've told you about, um, including, oh, sorry, i just go back. Wolfham Forest Oral History Society archives and Ambleside. 
in the Lake District as well. Okay. And they, they've got very interesting type things around food. Not surprisingly, um, because of when they chose to, to, to look, they've got things uh, uh, with people talking about um, scarcity of various things post-war and so on. So uh, this woman saying that she went into Wareham for rations and <coughs> weekly shopping, but can't spend all her points because um, tea is the only thing that's short because milk and eggs are plentiful. Okay. And that one of the things that they argue is very much fitting with narrative analysis. People are much more likely to reflect on and report their food, food practices during difficult times, so times of austerity. We're having tin veg this weekend. I just cannot pay two shillings for a cauliflower, and there was nothing else, not even a fresh carrot. We're also having old potatoes. Okay. Mother, I think, found rationing difficult in the First War, but you had this very old cook who could make things out of nothing at all. She would use all sorts of unspecified parts of pig and turn them into wonderful mints. I can remember that. We were short of fat, so I remember that. Okay. Um, less meat and so on. Okay. Smoked haddock for Sunday, Sunday dinner. I always remember that. Okay. And um, they, their methodological reflections are very much around solicited and unsolicited accounts. Moving on, I want to show you a little bit of um, what we did um, for the Paradata study. So these are the small ones. Recipes for mothering, which was mode and novella, and the possibilities of narrative analysis with Paradata. Okay, and briefly what they did in Recipes for Mothering was analyze two mother's food blogs, okay, about feeding children. Okay. Um, but I won't say uh, more about that. You can look at our website if you're interested in it. I'll say a little bit about Paradata before stopping. Okay. Um, so, um, one of the things that we were interested in is to think about whether uh, it made sense to think about narrative paradata. Paradata has become very popular in surveys, in quantitative surveys, where people do it on um, computers. Because um, you may have heard some of the debate about in the uh, British election how poor people were at um, actually predicting who would win. Okay? The surveys are really poor at doing that. So how do you make surveys better? And how do you make sure people take part and answer all the questions? Well, Paradata looks at things like keystrokes, where people go to. If you've taken part in a survey recently, you might, when you've um, uh, done one answer, be reminded that you skipped something or that you didn't spend very long on that question and you might, might you want to think about it again or for longer or might you want to go back to something. That's because they're using Paradata and recording it in order to try to make it better. Well, what we did was to go back to Peter Townsend's survey of poverty in, in the UK, which was a large um, survey that really changed the way that, that we understand poverty, away from absolute terms to relative poverty. And the data are stored in the data archive. And Ros Edwards at the Hub noticed that the researchers, the interviewers, frequently wrote a lot in the margins of those um, uh, um, interview booklets. So she wanted to think about, and she wanted us uh, as a narrative um, uh, uh, node to think about whether we could do narrative analysis on, on that. So it was all about the possibilities of narrative analysis on things not designed for it. And I, I, I'll skip most of this, but this is what it looked like. We had to go and look at um, the, the bundles of material and um, think about it. And this is, is just how it might be written. So this is a researcher who's written, well, you can read it yourself. You've obviously read it yourself, OK, um, that kind of thing. And this is what it looks like. But I wanted to say a bit more about this. This, is some, this sometimes happened. This was um, pay, uh, um, sellotaped onto the booklet by the interviewer. So sometimes they actually wrote more. Okay. And um, this is a page. The informant in this case was deaf. Two calls were made at the house. No answer first visit. 
At second, no answer was received. I called next door and was told that the informant was deaf. I asked if help could be given with a questionnaire, but was told that the informant was odd and no one had anything to do with her. I called at house again and informant came to the door. After a while, she allowed me in. I stayed about an hour. Informant managed to hear some of what I said if I talked down her ear. She was 83 years of age and it was obviously impossible to ask her the questions in an ordinary way. We talked and I managed to ask her quite a few of the relevant questions. It was rather sad. Informant had lived alone for two years. Sister died in 1966. Informant kept on crying. On this bright summer evening, we sat in front parlour with curtains drawn and lights on. Newspapers covered the good chairs. Informant did not really understand why I was there, hoped that perhaps I might manage to get her more money to live on. She would not, however, think of applying for national assistance. I think, though, that something could be done for her. Informant constantly said, there is no debt here. I've completed the questionnaire as best as I can. Informant said that she never had any, anyone in, was completely independent. I came away wishing I could help Informant and would like to call again. Also, Informant talked so much about her dead sister Ada that completely forgot to ask Informant's name. Okay. Well, I think you can see immediately that one can do narrative analysis on this and indeed much else. And I should say that unlike nowadays, certainly the Townsend team sometimes went and gave grants to um, people. It was a, a survey of poverty, uh, people living in poverty, although they didn't only study those who were in poverty, they also studied people who were more affluent. Um, but they, they, they did sometimes do things for people, and it was partly because of the interviewers who wrote things like this on the sides of the interviews. Okay. And then we were deeply impressed with how much work this team put into checking and editing. Okay. So this is what they say. We are checking and editing in green and, green and purple pens. May we ask interviewers to continue to use the more prosaic colours of black, blue and red. And you can see with a finished booklet what it looks like. It's passed through many hands, been checked many times. So they also had people who would sometimes go back to interviews, to interviewees, to do something that they felt wasn't done well or whatever, or to check and so on. So very, very careful, okay? Um, but certainly uh, showed team dynamics, and that's some of the reasons that, that, that people did this. And we just couldn't resist this. I mean, so somebody has obviously got fed up with a number of points on, on uh, the interview, join the dots to make a picture of the survey so far on this booklet. And we absolutely forgot um, to um, uh, take a note of one that didn't have much paradata on, and so we didn't, uh, didn't um, uh, pull out for further analysis, but that we loved, which said, um, uh, this old lady was very deaf. Things improved somewhat when she took off her balaclava. <laughs> okay, just to conclude, um, one of the things that I hope that you can see from Novella, and I really hope you'll look at our website if you're at all interested in these sorts of issues, methodological or substantive, that one of the things that, that um, uh, we, we got very well is that different members of families understand their practices differently, and that it's possible to see both from reuse of material and new data collection, the multiple levels at which narratives are produced. Okay. Um, different research participants, different primary researchers, novella researchers, and so on. So that what constitutes reuse of material is not straightforward. Um, that family practices are most evident when something is disrupted, for example, through migration, and that how the past is remembered What's included in the stories told certainly um, relates to the things we know about narrative, what happened in um, the, 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 the present, what's happening in the present, and anticipations of the future. So one of the things we were interested in was very much the disconnect between what's said and what's done. And because time is up, and I would like you to have time to discuss, I won't go into that. Um, but thank you very much for your attention. And um, what I suggest that we do now is um, because it's important that you don't
just sit there fidgeting alone. Uh, but um, in order to think about what you want to discuss, if you could spend just um, five minutes talking in groups of three or four with each other, but not about what you're going to eat or how hungry you are or anything, or indeed how boring I was, but about something substantive that you can bring back to the discussion in a few minutes. Is that okay? Yeah.